Hi there and welcome to this presentation on an introduction to radar. My name is James Henderson and I'm an engineering consultant at FlexTech uh, and this is really just a brief overview on the challenges and opportunities of radar. So what is radar? Radar is actually an acronym which stands for Radiation Detection and Ranging and is a form of sensor which uses electromagnetic waves in the radio spectrum to detect objects in its surroundings. To be able to detect the objects, the object does not necessarily need to be metallic, it just needs electrical properties that are significantly different to its surroundings. This ensures that any incident radio signals from the radar sensor that hit it are scattered, with some of those signals coming back towards the radar. This allows the radar to not only detect it, but also range or calculate how far away the object is by a simple time of flight measurement. Now, whilst the RF or microwave signal will travel at the speed of light, or at least close to it in air, which may be very fast, but even at a short range with electronics as advanced as it is today, we can still calculate that very short time the electromagnetic wave travels these short distances. This allows the radar to calculate how far away something is, but also to be able to work out the angle or bearing to the object. Generally, we need to repeat this process using directive signals at different angles to build up a wider field of view. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about how this is done later on in the presentation. So if you are at all familiar with radar and the various ranging techniques, you've probably come across pulse radar, which is probably the most traditional approach to radar sensing. Here we transmit a very short, sharp pulse with a very high peak power so that we can detect objects which are a reasonably long distance away or fairly small. However, to get a relatively good resolution and range, we need to make sure that the transmitted pulse is very narrow. And to do that, we need a reasonable amount of bandwidth. So although the pulse may have a specific center frequency, the system needs to operate over a reasonable bandwidth around this frequency to keep the pulse narrow. And this is not just for the antenna, but the entire front end of the radar sensor. However, this approach is very simple to process. Because we're just measuring the time it takes for the reflected signal to be returned, if indeed it is, this can make this approach a reasonably low cost way of implementing a long range sensor. We can also detect if the object is moving towards or away from the sensor by the change in frequency of the reflected signal. So for example, if the object we have detected is coming towards the radar, the reflected signal will shift up in frequency as a result of the Doppler effect. Generally, with pulse radar, we don't just transmit a signal pulse, but, we, but a train of pulses to improve the sensitivity of the radar. However, this introduces another challenge, which is that you don't necessarily know whether the pulse you've just received came from the most recently transmitted pulse, or from one that was transmitted earlier. To reduce this ambiguity due to the aliasing effect, we can implement pulse compression techniques where we change the characteristics of each pulse such that we can remove some level of uncertainty from which pulse it came from. This is a good approach if you are looking to detect fast moving objects which are a long way away, as these are the main factors which become amb ambiguous with aliasing from the pulse train. There are also various other opportunities for pulse radar, such as using pseudo random noise transmission sequences to reduce the detectability of the transmitted radar signal, for example. There are various other techniques which can be used with pulse radar to improve the performance for a specific scenario, um, but these won't be discussed in this presentation. Another ranging technique which we are starting to see a lot more of now, and one which we use regularly at PlexTech, is continuous wave uh, techniques, such as frequency modulated continuous wave, or FMCW. This is where we continuously transmit a signal which is modulated generally with a linear frequency ramp. This allows us to continuously receive any reflected signals and integrate over a longer time period. This improves the signal to noise ratio or radar sensitivity without the need to transmit a particularly large signal as you do in pulse radar. However, unlike pulse systems, the range information is actually in the frequency domain. So we are required to transform the received signal from the time domain to the frequency domain, which is generally done with the fast Fourier transform. This is an additional process which is required, which can be quite processing intensive, and it's maybe one reason why this technique has not been used so much in the past. But now processing is more readily available, this is not such a bad solution from that point of view. There are also various other opportunities with continuous wave ranging techniques, um, particularly uh, for operation at higher frequencies, such as at microwave or even millimeter wave frequencies, for example. Uh, this is because there's a lot of bandwidth available at this frequency, so generating wideband chirps is much easier. Um, in a similar fashion to pulsed radar, we can achieve a very high range resolution with this wide bandwidth. But also at these frequencies, it's much more difficult to generate high peak powers 
that are required for pulsed radar. So it's a way of improving the radar sensor uh, whilst using lower transmit powers, um, which is required at higher frequencies. So this is an example of the output of an FMCW radar sensor, which we were testing outside uh, in the fields behind Plextech. And in the bottom right hand corner, you can see an image of the radar sensor looking towards the scaffold pole, um, which you can see in the distance. Um, on the top right hand corner is a proximate image of the beam that's been transmitted towards the scaffold pole. So you can see that this is about three degrees by three degrees in azimuth and elevation. On the graph on the top left, we can see that the scaffold pole is about 17 meters away from the radar. And, and that's uh, uh, quite obvious with the very large return uh, that it's given there. Uh, but before the scaffold pole, we can actually see the return from the ground as it's getting more and more into the beam as we get further away from the radar. Um, and this is important to consider that this is not noise, that this is actually clutter and it is a valid return from the ground. Um, and whilst it makes it a little bit more difficult to detect objects on the ground because they're competing with the ground itself, um, it also gives us quite a lot of uh, valid information. For example, as we get further away to about 30 meters, we see that, that, that we can't actually detect the ground. And, and that's actually because it's not there. Um, being close to Cambridge, uh, this is actually a subsidiary of the River Cam that's uh, passing by the Plexitech office. Um, and whilst we're looking over here, we, we don't get any return from the ground, uh, which gives us a lot of information. For example, if you were an autonomous car driving along, you would know that there's there's no ground here and uh, you might fall down a ditch or into the river in this case. Uh, so this is actually very useful information. Um, as we go further away, out towards 40 metres or so, we can see the vegetation on the far bank, which is actually then shadowing the field um, from the farm behind. Um, until about 80 meters when we then start to, to detect it again with the radar in a very similar fashion to the way we can see it. One big advantage with radar is that actually this would be very little affected if it was at night or, uh, or not affected at all or, or in foggy conditions, for example. Um, so this makes radar very powerful for, for adverse weather conditions, for example. So in the previous example, the radar was pointing in a specific direction but you may well want to build up a larger field of view and be able to detect objects from a range of different angles. Um, one of the classic uh, approaches for this is a mechanically scanned antenna. For example, an air traffic control radar will probably have a rotating antenna on the top of the mast, which is slowly rotating and detecting aircraft in the sky over the full 360 degree sweep. Um, and this is generally shown in this PPI plot as uh, displayed on the right or plan position indicator where it can detect objects in the sky, not just what angle they are, but also how far away they are. However, there are many reasons why you might not want a mechanically scanned system. Um, and electronic scanning is another approach uh, which offers many uh, other advantages, but can be very challenging to implement. Uh, the most popular approach is using phase arrays, whether they're active or passive. Um, but there are other approaches out there, um, depending on what application and frequency range and so on that you're aiming to design your radar for. Um, and we'll discuss some of the different uh, approaches for electronic scanning in the uh, latter part of the presentation. However, first, here's an example of the detections from a mechanically scanned version of the radar, which we used previously. Um, this time we're mechanically scanning it over a 40 degree field of view, uh, plus or minus 20 degrees. And 
shown on the right, we can detect uh, the cars quite clearly, as shown in red or even black, where there's a very strong return uh, of the transmitted signal. Um, and beyond the cars, we can also uh, detect the increased clutter from the gravel beyond the car park. Uh, and then beyond that, the wooden building in the field also shows up as quite a strong return to the radar. And even beyond that, the metal bench on the far side of the field, which we can't really see uh, on the visual image on the left. However, what's quite important here is, is that we can also detect where there isn't any uh, strong returns, uh, namely down the centre between the cars parked on either side. Uh, and this would be important, for example, for an autonomous car to be able to safely drive without crashing into these parked cars, which would otherwise be quite difficult to detect because uh, because they're stationary, we're not able to, to discriminate them uh, using Doppler. So we must uh, do that in this example using um, angular resolution. And it's really resolution that is being able to tell that um, there is a clear gap uh, down the centre of the car park. So here we're showing the design of an electronically scanned radar, uh, which actually has very similar parameters to the previous mechanically scanned uh, system uh, with a similar range and angular resolution. Uh, but here we have no moving parts and we're able to scan the beam electronically. Uh, we've used a frequency scanning antenna approach, re generally uh, referred to as a um, meander line design. And this way we have a fixed delay line between each of the 48 antenna elements on the transmit and receive antennas. Uh, we've actually used two separate antennas for the transmit and receive, really so that we can get a good isolation between them, given that we're actually transmitting and receiving at a similar frequency. Um, so by having a, a fixed delay line uh, between each antenna element, as we change the frequency, the wavelength changes, and this causes a progressive phase shift along the array, which results in the peak gain of the antenna uh, changing uh, with uh, changing its angle as we uh, adjust the frequency. And this allows us to scan over a 34 degree field of view uh, using the available bandwidth, which um, is actually in the 60 gigahertz license free band. However, with only 48 antenna elements, this actually gives us a limited amount of antenna gain. Uh, so to improve this, we've used a sectoral horn, which is shown in the bottom left hand corner, which is placed on top of the PCB. This results in the elevation beam width being reduced quite significantly as it directs more of the signal horizontal to the or perpendicular to the radar uh, sensor PCB, um, which increases the gain, uh, but reduces its sensitivity from objects above and below the radar. So this is an example of the radar being used um, actually at the side of the building here at Plexo, looking at the road uh, showing the cars driving past. And on the top left hand corner here, we can see as the car drives past, you get a very strong return um, in range and angle. And in the bottom left hand corner, we can also see uh, the Doppler as the car is moving towards or away from the radar. It colours red or, or blue, depending on its, uh, its radial velocity. Um, what you might have noticed is that sometimes the cars go from red to blue. And this is actually because the Doppler is wrapping or it's aliasing. Uh, because actually we've got the, the settings on the radar really designed for people walking rather than cars. Uh, but this is a, an example of where actually you need to configure your radar sensor for the objects uh, that you're intending to detect um, to ensure that you get the best results uh, out of your sensor. So another approach to electronically scanned radars, which is becoming particularly popular at the moment, is this ubiquitous or sometimes referred to as MIMO radar approach, where instead of forming a narrow beam on the transmit and receive antenna arrays, we actually flood the entire scene with the transmitted signal and then use multiple receivers to simultaneously receive over the entire field of view as well, but from slightly different locations. Uh, this allows us to be able to calculate the angle of arrival from uh, any objects within the scene uh, in the receiver processing. Um, and 
Further to that, we can also transmit from slightly different locations, and by comparing the signals from both, we can also gain further information such as elevation, uh, as this example on the right hand side shows. Um, there are many advantages with this. Uh, the big one is that we can simultaneously uh, detect and track multiple objects in the scene um, and we can get quite a high sensitivity because we're able to integrate over the scene for quite a long period of time. However, the downside is that we generally can't have quite a high resolution, uh, partly because it's not very scalable because we need to have an entire uh, receiver behind every single receive element, uh, which is not the case in a, a, a scanned array approach, for example. So I also just wanted to touch on SAR radar imaging. SAR, which stands for Synthetic Aperture Radar, is an approach used to be able to generate a very large antenna aperture and therefore a very fine angular resolution uh, from a radar which actually, was actually very small. So by physically moving the radar over a scene, uh, so for example, scanning it over this replica firearm shown on the uh, left hand image, we're able to generate the image here shown on the right. And actually this image here was generated when the replica firearm was placed inside a cardboard box, demonstrating the ability for hidden or concealed object detection um, by looking through the cardboard which the RF signal is able to penetrate. And actually this is a 2D slice in the 3D image that we're able to generate. I hope that this brief overview on radar has been useful and highlighted that there are many different things which need to be taken into consideration when designing a radar sensor for a specific application or scenario, but there are also a lot of different techniques which can be used, some which are more appropriate for others, depending on what you are trying to detect. Just briefly, uh, Plextech was founded in 1988 as an electronic design consultancy and consists of over 75 technologists and engineers with a wide range of different uh, skill sets to help our clients develop uh, and design different systems for their needs. If you would like to get in contact with us, uh, the contact details are at the bottom of this slide and I'm sure Shazad would be uh, delighted to uh, speak to you. Thank you.